Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar Overcoming Barriers to Investing in Energy Efficiency hosted by Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency. My name is Ksenia and I'm a senior advisor at the Copenhagen Center. A couple of things before we move to the main content of our webinar. This webinar is going to be about 70-75 minutes, including time for questions and answers at the end. In case you cannot stay until the end or want to get back to our interesting presentations, all the materials and recordings of this webinar will, will be available online in a few days on the Copenhagen Center's knowledge management system. And we have many other webinars and uh, information materials there, so it's worth checking. So let's start. Um, a few words about uh, the Copenhagen Center. Our center conducts research and advisory activities in the field of energy efficiency and serves as energy efficiency hub for Sustainable Energy for All initiative. The center has an established network of global, regional, national and local partners uh, with a broad range of stakeholders to help to accelerate the implementation of energy uh, efficiency activities. One of our activities, we're on a regular basis conducting uh, different webinars and all materials, including recordings and presentations from all previous webinars, and uh, including this one, can be found on Copenhagen Center's knowledge management system. You can see the link here. Uh, we have e-learning uh, section here, uh, which you can explore, and we have a lot of uh, interesting materials there on very various topics. But today we're going to talk about investing into energy efficiency, which is a very interesting and important topic. And I would like to briefly introduce you uh, to our speakers of today's webinar. Starting from myself, um, as I said, I'm a senior advisor at the Copenhagen Center. Uh, and today I will just introduce the topic and say a few words about global trends on energy efficiency, uh, setting the global scene of um, our topic today. Then we have Oleg Zubinski, who is a regional advisor from the UN Economic Commission for Europe. And he will talk about barriers to investing in energy efficiency and ways to overcome them. He will introduce the findings of uh, a joint uh, UNIC and Copenhagen Center's publication uh, on overcoming barriers to investing in energy efficiency. And then we have Katerina Shalmak, uh, who is a senior research associate at ICIM. She will provide us with a comprehensive overviews of uh, existing models for financing uh, energy efficiency projects and she will feature some concrete and very interesting examples from her own work. So um, we will conclude um, our webinar, as I mentioned, with a question and answer session. And you are very much encouraged to send your questions during the presentations already. Uh, no, no need to wait until the end. Of course, you can do it at the end as well. Um, but we will collect all the questions, not to interrupt the, the presenters, um, and we'll answer them at once at the end of the webinar. It's also useful if you can mention uh, a name of the speaker when you send your question so that we can facilitate uh, this session a bit better. So let me start with um, my presentation and um, giving some background to the importance of this topic. As you know, the 24th session of the Conference of the Parties, COP24, has just started in Katowice, Poland, where countries have come together to discuss the ways and the progress so far to achieve the Paris Agreement made in 2015 to keep the global temperature increase below 2 degrees Celsius. For those of you who are following this process, uh, I'm sure you've heard of um, recent IPCC uh, special report which summarizes uh, what it would take to achieve the 1.5 uh, degrees limit and what the consequences would be uh, if we miss that potential. It's a very interesting report and uh, the details of this report are definitely worth understanding, but there is one uh, simple and critical takeaway point from, from that, that the world needs to cut emissions as much as possible and as fast as possible. 
And currently, unfortunately, with uh, our current trends of emissions, uh, we are heading to more than three degrees global warming by 2100. Very similar findings. Um, these findings were confirmed by another global study, the UN Emissions uh, Gap Report, which was issued um, just uh, last week, with a, with a very key, clear key message that current national commitments on uh, emission reductions are not sufficient to bridge the emission gap by 2030. It is still possible to ensure that we stay uh, within uh, two or even 1.5 degree limits, but uh, countries really need to scale up their ambitions before uh, 2030, otherwise this potential will, will be lost. If we take a closer look at uh, the energy uh, sector and uh, some of the findings which were uh, launched by IA in their energy efficiency market report this year, we can see that um, we are also quite uh, off track in terms of uh, achieving these goals from the energy perspective. The global energy, primary energy demand rose by 2% in 2017, which is the largest annual increase since 2010 and well above uh, levels in 2015 and 2016, with the most of this increase coming from emerging economies. The combination of increased economic and energy uh, demand growth also resulted in in the uh, increase uh, in in the fact that the global primary energy intensity um, reduction slowed down and uh, decreased only by 1.7% in 2017, which is also the slowest rate of decline uh, since 2010, and it is not sufficient to achieve global goals. At the same time, uh, if we look at the scenarios presented by IA, we can see that energy efficiency could provide more than 40% of the emission reductions required by 2040 to be in line with the Paris Agreement. And together with renewables, we, we, are really, we can really achieve substantial potential for emissions reductions. But if we look at the investment uh, side and we are coming uh, to the core of our uh, discussion today, we can see that the amount of the global investments into energy efficiency are also quite off track and not uh, up to speed uh, to fulfill the Paris Agreement's requirements. Uh, across all the sectors, uh, since 2016, energy efficiency investments globally grew just by 3% and reached 236 uh, billion US dollars in 2017. The adoption of, of uh, energy efficient technologies to realize the global economically feasible potential for energy efficiency improvement um, requires this investment to double by 2025 and double again after 2025. So we can see that the requirement to increase uh, investments into energy efficiency are quite significant. That means that we need to improve the scale of implementation of energy efficiency at all levels, starting with projects, um, going to the city scale, making sure that the city actions are up to speed and uh, correspond to the scale which needs for this commitment to be achieved. Uh, which would be integrated into national programs, into national policy development, uh, in order to achieve the global goals which we're talking about. However, the reality today is that there are many small scale and fragmented projects when we talk about energy efficiency. It's very hard to attribute what uh, measures are actually energy efficient. Also, there is insufficient local uh, capacity in cities and at the local level to develop bankable projects, which would be interested for investors. And of course, therefore, there are issues with accessing the finance to fund these projects. So one of, um, one of the key areas which uh, we at the Copenhagen Center were looking at is what we call project aggregation or project bundling, which can help to aggregate a number of typical or similar projects in terms of 
their technical solutions, procurement processes, technical assistance requirements, capacity building requirements, and so on and so forth, into a, a, a larger thematic investment portfolio in order to increase the investment threshold and also increase the interest from various uh, investors and financiers into these projects. And we see that there are three key pillars to, uh, to this process, starting with standardization of uh, project processes, aggregating of uh, projects uh, and operations uh, within a single framework, as well as facilitation of implementation of development and implementation of this project at, uh, at various levels. So I'm having um, this structure in mind, we are working with both national and local level um, governments in order to encourage them to design and implement on this kind of aggregated uh, projects in, in their localities. We're developing standardized data collection um, and analysis processes and also looking at examples and methodologies how uh, these projects can be actually bundled together what are financial instruments, models, and procurement procedures which can help to implement this uh, process, how we can access investment for actual project implementation, and how um, all these can contribute to the achievement of sustainable development goal and the uh, target set by the Paris Agreement. Just to give you a few examples uh, before I jump to our speakers today, um, we are having several projects uh, or trying to pilot this kind of um, model of work in several countries, uh, looking at, for example, energy efficiency street lighting and uh, working across uh, multiple municipalities in several countries uh, like Georgia, Armenia and uh, Argentina, trying to figure out for each of the countries which are the uh, administrative and project development and financial models would be uh, tailored and applicable in their local context to be able to um, finance and implement this project. We're also doing work um, on energy efficiency in buildings, developing methodology for standardized data collection and creating interactive depository of uh, project level data, which can then be aggregated uh, into bundles and starting piloting the data collection process um, in uh, several countries. However, our work still shows that there is quite a substantial gap uh, between potential projects on one side and potential investors in the other side. And we need to make sure that there is a flow of bankable project from, from the local level, from project developers, from cities, from countries, uh, towards investors and that investors can ensure that there is a funding for project development and implementation. And I think with that, um, it's uh, very important, first of all, uh, to understand what are potential barriers which are um, preventing that from happening, because obviously if, if uh, those barriers didn't exist, there would be no not such a gap and we will not be so much behind in terms of um, accelerating uh, investments into energy efficiency projects. So with that, I will uh, hand it over to Oleg who will be talking about um, his findings on what the potential barriers are to investments into energy efficiency from different countries. Uh, and what potential ways uh, we can use and what are his insights on how these barriers can be can be addressed. Um, Oleg, I'm going to hand over the screen to you in, in, in a second. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Xenia, for this introduction and for setting the stage and the tone for, for the discussion and for my presentation. I will speak about the uh, findings of the joint research on overcoming barriers to investing in energy efficiency, uh, which resulted uh, uh, in a publication uh, by UNEC and Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency. Uh, we did it uh, in uh, 2017. Uh, we have done a survey uh, of uh, experts in the area of energy efficiency and energy efficiency financing 
trying to address uh, the topics of identifying barriers that prevent energy efficiency investments from happening, and that includes political, regulatory, economic, and social ones, defining successful policies and actions that help overcome barriers to financing energy efficiency, recommending ways to increase the financial flows, and mapping the roles of stakeholders such as governments, financial institutions, businesses, and project developers in promoting and implementing energy efficiency investments. Um, we now have the publication. It's available in English and Russian. It will soon be available also in French. And uh, um, we have received a significant number of responses. The survey was global. Uh, we tried to make a focus on the countries of the UNEC region. That's 56 countries uh, of North America, Western Europe, uh, Southeastern and Eastern Europe, the Caucasus and Central Asia as well as the Russian Federation, um, Israel, and Turkey. Uh, so the results that we have received, uh, we were able to also do some uh, country-specific analysis for countries uh, from which we received eight or more responses, and you see them on the screen. Uh, we also included in some of our analysis Georgia. Uh, we only received six responses, but they were pretty consistent. Uh, I have to say that uh, the, uh, the stakeholders who responded were quite diverse. We received uh, responses from national governments, uh, regional and local governments, from business, from the financial institutions, international organizations, uh, NGOs, uh, academia, and independent experts. Um, so what, what this study presents is essentially the uh, uh, the perceptions. It doesn't give you the hard data. It looks at the perce perceptions of experts. Uh, some of them actually have to make investment decisions uh, into this issue. And I, very often this is even more important because investment decisions are often made based on perceptions more than on hard data. So that's from our perspective is the value of this study. Uh, now let's look at some of the findings. Uh, this slide presents the uh, uh, answers to two questions. The first one is, uh, are there investment opportunities for energy efficiency in your country? And the re uh, respondents were asked to um, assess them on a scale from one, very few, to five, many. And uh, then a related question is, what level of investments in energy efficiency does your country receive? Again, based on what a particular expert thinks. So what you see here, the global rate of responses, uh, the investments opportunities are considered to be quite high. Its average are actually almost four. And uh, the actual level of investments as perceived by experts is much lower. And that is, uh, the feature for essentially almost all countries. You see that investment opportunities are very often viewed as quite significant, while the actual investments are significantly low. Even for the countries that we believe are uh, doing quite well with energy efficiency and with investments in energy efficiency, such as US and Germany, you can see that the uh, actual investments as perceived by the experts are relatively low, still higher than in other countries, but not as high as the investment opportunities. Uh, we go now to the UNEC region. Uh, it's very similar to the global. And then we go to the two um, distinct regions. One is Eastern Europe, the Caucasus and Central Asia, and the other is Eastern, uh, uh, well, EU and Western Europe. And uh, you see there is quite a significant difference in terms of both existence of investment opportunities and the actual investments. And then you see uh, some differences, significant differences by the countries. Uh, in some cases, uh, like Georgia, uh, both are pretty low. In some cases, like Ukraine, you see the investment opportunities are viewed, uh, or Armenia, very high, while the actual investments are uh, viewed as very low. Uh, there was a set of questions regarding the legislation programs and policies that support investments in energy efficiency. 
And the question was, does, does your country have the following legislation? And you have separate items, uh, the actual programs uh, and policies to support investments, norms and standards, bylaws, essentially secondary legislation, and the framework legislation. Uh, and as you can see from uh, this slide, in most of the countries, the framework legislation in particular, but also other types of legislation programs and policies exist. It varies by uh, region and by country, but generally it is there. However, what is the effectiveness of the regulatory work, uh, framework? And we can see again, the slide here presents mostly countries from the UNEC region, but we also have introduced India here. Um, we see that the uh, existence of regulatory framework to support investments in energy efficiency, uh, and for that we use the percentage of average of positive responses on four types of legislation that was presented before, is mostly pretty high with a couple of exceptions such as Azerbaijan, uh, also the case of Georgia and the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. We're talking only about the countries that submitted a sufficient number of responses. However, in terms of the actual support for investment that that regulatory framework for, provides, it varies. And if for Germany, it's pretty high. For many of other countries, it's relatively uh, low. So the conclusions that we were able to make out of this set of responses is that globally and in the UNEC region, there is a high or reasonably high potential for energy efficiency investments. Uh, however, this potential in many countries remains largely, largely untapped. There is a significant gap between investment opportunities for energy efficiency and the actual level of investments in energy efficiency in most of the countries. Uh, most of the countries in the UNEC region have framework legislation for energy efficiency. Many have other supporting legislation, programs and policies. In the sub-region of Western Europe and North America, essentially all components of the regulatory framework are in place and are considered to be relatively effective, but still not always providing very strong support and enabling energy efficiency investments. In other parts of the region, the situation varies and some countries lag bylaws, norms and standards, and specific programs and policies. There is also, in general, a good correlation between the existence of the regulatory framework and how well it supports and enables investments in energy efficiency. Uh, for example, Germany, as I said, possesses strong regulatory framework that ensures strong support for investments. In Azerbaijan and the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, it's the other way around. The regulatory framework is considered weak and it provides little support to investments. Belarus, Kazakhstan and Ukraine mostly have a regulatory framework in place, but the support it provides for energy efficiency investments is not considered strong, particularly in Ukraine. The conclusions on the financial environment, it is not viewed as very favorable for investments in energy efficiency. Familiarity of financial institutions with financing energy efficiency projects and measures is relatively low in many countries of the world, including developed countries and countries with economies in transition in the UNEC region. Financial institutions still view financing of energy efficiency projects significantly riskier compared to other types of business projects. Conditions for repayment and servicing energy efficiency loans with savings generated from improved efficiency are considered generally more favorable for projects in the public sector than for projects in the private sector. But in most cases, they are not too favorable. The price of energy uh, provides uh, in incentive for improving energy efficiency, but it is often insufficient, particularly when that price is low. Uh, on the energy pricing, situation differs significantly among countries. In the UNEC region, it provides a rather strong incentive in countries such as Ukraine and Armenia, moderate incentive in Germany and Albania, and a very weak one in Croatia and Switzerland. Among the selected countries outside the UNEC region, the strongest incentive from energy prices is in Brazil, and the weakest is in India. I continue with the conclusions. Uh, low awareness about the multiple benefits of energy efficiency projects is viewed as the main barrier to increasing investment and financing close to energy efficiency projects. Next important factors 
a lack of understanding of energy efficiency financing by banks and other financial institutions, administrative barriers and bureaucracy, and low energy prices. And there is, of course, differences between the countries. What is the main problem, a main barrier? What are the uh, less significant barriers? Uh, now, speaking of uh, what are the most important factors that can lead to increasing energy efficiency project investment viability in particular countries, and very often it is tax incentives and low interest loans. They are followed by stricter energy efficiency standards, training and awareness programs, improved legislation, and the risking of investments through government support programs. Uh, in the countries, there are specific factors that are in, identified as the main ones. In Armenia, Belarus, Croatia, and Ukraine, it's the low interest loans. In Azerbaijan, improved legislation. Um, this is not surprising, bearing in mind that it doesn't exist there yet, although the draft law on energy efficiency uh, is in the process of being adopted. In Kazakhstan, improved access to commercial financing. In Germany, tax incentives, uh, and so on. Uh, we have developed uh, recommendations, and I would list just two of them. Uh, more you will find in the publication. One is that raising awareness about the multiple benefits of energy, pro pro energy efficiency projects can be recommended as one of the most effective measures to increase investment and financing flows to energy efficiency projects. And this may require developing a system of assigning value to non-economic benefits so that it can be properly taken into account when making investment decisions. Uh, also, the recommendation is that in the short and medium term, particularly in the countries with economies in transition, tax incentives and low interest loans for energy efficiency projects should be considered as, as the most appropriate ways to increasing energy efficiency project investment viability. Uh, part of the study was specifically devoted to the uh, investments in industrial energy efficiency. Uh, one of the questions was, what are the main barriers that your company faces when considering investment in industrial energy efficiency? We have asked just the representatives of companies to respond to this question. And um, uh, the, what you can see here, and, and it's pretty consistent between the global uh, responses and the responses from the UNEC region, uh, the main barrier is the lack or high cost of capital, uh, followed quite closely by the low priority uh, because it is not part of the core business, uh, then uh, lack of government incentives and insufficient senior management commitment or unfavorable company environment. Uh, the question that is related, we believe, is what are the main business benefits to your company from implemented energy efficiency measures? And as you can see, uh, the most important benefit is actually improved production efficiency and quality, uh, followed by the general cost control. Uh, only then followed by the, dem the demonstration of the corporate social responsibility and compliance with legislation. So you can see that there is, uh, in a way, contradiction. Uh, the companies consider uh, the barrier as low priority of energy efficiency investments because it is not part of the core business. However, the business benefits that, that they get from the energy efficiencies is actually quite related to the main business activities. It's, it's improved production efficiency and quality and general cost control. Some of the conclusions, uh, I just mentioned them, them that the, uh, about the main barriers, low priority of energy efficiency, uh, because it's not part of the core business and the lack of high cost of capital and lack of government incentives. Uh, main business benefits I also listed. Um, it is also interesting that the majority of companies have either internal or compliance-driven energy efficiency or energy intensity goal, and energy efficiency decisions in companies are often made by the same people as core business decisions. Also, almost all companies implement some measures or projects to improve energy efficiency. Most common of them are implemented to enhance energy efficiency of buildings and to improve energy efficiency of plant and equipment. Some of the recommendations that we believe are quite relevant is uh, 
what I, what you see here uh, is addressed to governments and companies. The governments, in our view, should consider creating incentives for companies for improving energy efficiency through appropriate policies, while companies should consider implementation of energy efficiency measures as those that improve production efficiency and quality, lower cost of production, help demonstrate corporate social responsibility, and comply with legislation, and thus ultimately have a positive impact on the core business. Once again, the web link to the publication. We also have hard copies if you would like to request them in either, in either English or Russian. Please let me know. Uh, and I would like to thank you for um, listening to the presentation. My email address is on this slide. Thank you. And I would like now to um, give the floor to Katarina Stelmach. Thank you so much, Oleg. Um, good day or good evening or good morning to everyone. So um, I'm going to take over and um, talk a little bit more about um, available financial instruments and um, financing models when we talk about energy efficiency. In particular, um, this presentation is um, an outcome of a project um, which was part of the Interact Central Europe uh, funded project. It's called Dynamic Light and it was basically about how to uh, facilitate and promote um, investment and installation of dynamic light in central um, in Central Europe. Um, and that project, it had um, uh, several uh, kind of elements. So the target audience was the municipalities and the project was kind of a, a supporting and providing information and guidance to municipalities when it comes to dy uh, dynamic light um, from the technical perspective. So we had engineers and, and architects um, so technical people, people who looked at the, you know, um, technical part of that. Uh, we had lawyers who looked at the uh, legal elements of uh, street lighting and dynamic light in particular and overall procurement processes related to that. And we had financial side, which was about, um, okay, what kind of um, uh, funding sources are out there uh, for Central European countries and what kind of financial instruments um, and models uh, municipalities can employ or access to to finance their street street lighting projects um, and especially dynamic light project um, projects. Um, and um, the only thing is that when we, when we talk about street lighting, of course, we talk about energy efficiency and the financing models we covered in this um, part. Uh, they are applicable not only to street lighting. They are there are quite a few very general um, and broader financial instruments and models which can be applied to any any area of um, energy efficiency investment. So I will start kind of like from the funding sources. We had a webinar before on the funding sources, which was presented by my colleague, but um, just kind of as a starting point. And when I talk about, um, you know, when I say like I or we or whatever, I'm always talking about from the perspective of the municipality, because very often it's the municipality who owns um, a specific public assets like buildings or street lighting or whatever, and they are the ones who are supposed to, um, you know, um, invest into energy, uh, energy efficiency and upgrade either the street lighting or the social housing or uh, whatever is on, on their balances. So um, we'll start from the sources and um, you can see like uh, that there are actually multiple sources when we talk about uh, finance and um, of course, like the first um, and the most limited uh, source is the municipality's own resources, its own budget, uh, which it can use for um, for uh, energy efficiency investment. But then um, we have all of the, um, uh, you know, like diversity of um, um, national and subnational uh, programs, but also within the EU because project, excuse me, focused on the EU. Um, um, uh, member states, uh, there are also multiple EU support programs. So that's on the public side. Then we have financial institutions and intermediaries and banks uh, who also um, are important finance providers. And then we come to a private sector, which includes, um, you know, multiple actors and stakeholders. And um, depending um, 
with who you work, with the public sources and institutions or private sources, you can work with uh, multiple financial instruments and um, models. Uh, for example, uh, when we talk about own resources, we talk about either direct budget spending or we can uh, think about um, smarter ways of spending, spending budget and there we come to um, a different type of uh, revolving schemes which I will um, brief, uh, in, introduce um, later. Uh, then if we talk about um, uh, national and subnational or any, any kind of public finance supporting programs, um, they mostly work with grants and concessional loans. Of course, there are maybe uh, some other um, more advanced or, or sophisticated financial instruments, but um, these are the ones who are really uh, kind of prevail on the market. Uh, when we talk about banks or financial intermediaries, we talk about different debt and equity instruments, and we can talk also about project finance, which is a little bit more um, complex arrangement for a larger project. Um, and then we have a group of, uh, for example, um, ESCOs and installers who are going next. These are private investors, uh, which are um, actually energy efficiency is uh, one of their core expertise. Um, and you can work with these actors through um, contracting, energy performance contracts, uh, leasing or concession uh, contracts. Then we talk about um, uh, utilities, right? Um, and with the utilities, there are also, uh, for example, uh, within the EU member states, uh, some of the member states, that they have um, energy efficiency obligation schemes. And that's something that can also serve as a uh, funding source and um, financing models to um, to um, access um, finance for street lighting upgrades or actually any other energy efficiency upgrades. And then we have another uh, possibility, which is on-bill financing. I will briefly introduce um, it later. And then we have um, other group of investors, which are basically institutional investors or any other kind of um, investors which are not focused on an energy efficiency or even energy sector, but rather looking for investment opportunities. And here we'll also talk about uh, debt, equity, project finance, um, and crowdfunding is something that um, is um, uh, kind of growing in its popularity. Um, and um, yeah, this is um, basically one of the options how you can raise finance from citizens. So I will go slowly um, as much time as I have. Xenia, you have to stop me at some point. I hope I don't <laughs> run over my time. So I will go thoroughly, slowly through all of these models and try to introduce um, some of the, their main characteristics. So I will start from self-financing. It's basically when you are a municipality and you can, um, you have your limited budget and you can spend it either directly, you have a project and you, you know, make a budget allocation, you invest into a school or a street lighting project, and then project is done, money is spent. Um, or you can do a revolving scheme, which is basically um, using your budget in, um, you know, multiple cycles of uh, projects. So as an example, um, let's say you are a municipality, um, even though very often it happens that such revolving schemes, they are happening on the national level, or even on the regional level, but there are examples also on the city levels when um, a municipality uh, sets up a, a revolving fund, which can be uh, a separate entity or a part of the existing institution. And then instead of um, granting, providing grants for energy efficiency projects, you kind of provide loans, right? So they can be zero interest rate, but the point is that when the energy energy efficiency investment is done, the initial investment cost is uh, slowly paid back into this revolving fund. And once it's paid back, a revolving fund can provide this fi finance one more time for another energy efficiency project. And um, in this way, you use your money uh, not only once for one project, but for multiple um, investment cycles. And that, of course, um, include like it increases the, you know, how efficiently you use your uh, budget resources. And um, there are multiple examples of 
um, of such funds, um, for example, in the Netherlands, in uh, there are national funds in um, revolving funds in um, Croatia, in um, Bulgaria. So it's it's actually quite a common um, approach to finance um, energy efficiency um, in in many countries, but also on the municipal level. Um, then, uh, so that's about when you when you just have your own budget and how you manage your own budget. But of course, it's not uh, budget is something is there is very limited. So um, debt finance finance is an, another option, and there there are of course multiple debt instruments. But um, we would say that the most common ones uh, would be loans and bonds. So, so loans. It's quite simple, right? You can have a, a concessional loan, uh, which is um, something that is um, very often available um, um, as a national program. For example, uh, in Germany, there is a um, national development uh, bank, which is called KW, and they have a um, they have a subsidized by the government uh, loan programs for any different kinds of energy efficiency. Um, uh, measures by private sector households and public entities. And uh, the interest rates um, of these loan programs are very, very low. And plus, on the, on the top of that, you can get a grant. So um, in, in, in Germany, for example, these programs, they are really uh, driving energy efficiency retrofits in the building sector. But um, not in all of the countries uh, such programs exist. So um, um, uh, multilateral development banks, they um, very often have very similar kind of programs or instruments available. Um, these are credit lines which are um, below market, market interest rate and then um, they are available for multiple um, energy efficiency uh, measures. Or, of course, if if the, the low interest rate or concessional um, loans are not available, then commercial loan is always an option, but of course, the cost of capital then increases. The second instrument is bonds, which is getting um, kind of more popular and it is very promising instrument. Um, and basically here we have two options for municipalities. Um, so you can either have a municipal bond, uh, which municipality can issue either itself or it can uh, use support from the um, um, a bond agency if there is one available. So for example, in in many European countries, um, Scandinavia, like uh, I don't know, Western Europe, uh, Central Europe, um, um, Scandinavian countries, there are these municipal bond agencies that um, support municipalities in issuing their bonds. And because these agencies have um, very good, strong credit rating, they help to reduce the cost of capital of, of such bond. Plus, you know, um, if a, you as a single municipality want to go through the whole process of issuing a bond, it's quite a high transaction cost. So um, if you have a municipal bond agency in your country, that helps a lot because they help, they take, you know, this transaction cost and all of the administration of the issue and the bond, um, they take it on them. So, so that is, that is a big relief for municipalities. And um, one example would be uh, Gothenburg, which, um, oh, I'm very sorry. So that was the option number one, simple municipal bond, um, uh, which basically you, you issue a bond and then you you can use that this money for whatever you want. You can use it for energy efficiency, but you can also use it for roads, for whatever. Um, you can also, issue a green bond, which is the second option. And green bond means that you issue it specifically for green projects. Um, if you issue a green bond, it has to be certified by, um, by a dedicated end agency that does such certification. And green bond basically means that you use the capital that you raised, uh, you use for green projects. So renewable energy or energy efficiency or climate change. Uh, adaptation and so on. And uh, one example of of uh, green bonds which were issued by the city, it was the first city in the world to issue green bonds. It was the uh, Swedish city uh, Gothenburg. They started this in 2013. Um, they have um, they have the green bond program and it's basically kind of connected to the city's 
um, environmental and climate program. So they have a, a environmental and climate program, which sets all the, you know, priority actions uh, in terms of mitigation, adaptation, um, sustainable environment, and so on. And then that program is financed by issuing green bonds. And they are quite successful since 2013. They, they raised more than um, 500 million euros for the impl implementation of their measures. And um, the measures include not only energy efficiency, but also like electric cars and bicycle infrastructure and sustainable housing. So, so really um, diverse measures, which points again that um, all of these instruments, they have um, a lot of flexibility to uh, what type of investment you can use it. But of course, you have to um, structure and adjust your project accordingly to um, make it interesting for, especially for, for private investors. Um, and that, that would be uh, over with the debt financing, where we talk about loans and, and bonds. And now uh, we will move to um, a, a, another group of investors. Um, it's ASCOs and private contractors. And here um, you can also work with them in a different arrangement. So you can um, use contracting model, you can use energy performance contracting, you can have leasing um, model, or you can have a concession contract. Um, so in a contracting case, what does a contracting mean? It's basically, um, it means, um, so something that Oleg was mentioning that um, when you are a municipality and you have, um, you know, you have the street lighting uh, infrastructure on your balance and you have to do or like any other kind of, you know, public assets on your on your balance where you have to do the energy efficiency investment, the upfront cost of such investment is very high. And when you have to do it yourself, you put a huge burden on your budget and on your balance. So you want to avoid that upfront investment cost and you ideally you would like it that someone else does it, does it for you and carries you know this this uh, big investment cost on its balance sheet not yours so contracting model is something that helps with that because um, contracting model basically means that you as a municipality you uh, tender uh, um, and you hire outsource a contractor who um, basically does all the street lighting infrastructure for you um, based on your provided specifications, how you want to upgrade that street lighting infrastructure. They do the upfront investment. And then uh, you as a municipality, slowly, slowly in the next 10 years, you are paying off the cost on investment plus, you know, the margin they are going to charge you for you know, to do all the, all of the work. And um, uh, yeah, the biggest advantage is that uh, municipality doesn't have to carry the project cost on their balance sheet. They hire someone, they hire an expert, a specialized contract that um, is, you know, specialized in energy efficiency upgrades in street lighting or buildings or whatever. And they, they, the uh, municipalities can, you know, really specify in the tendering process what kind of upgrades they want to do. So, so that's great for mun from municipality. But on the other hand, on the other hand, because of these benefits, the financing cost is higher of such model. If you compare it, for example, you know, if you have just um, grant uh, grants available from the, you know, national public support program or you have a concessional loan and like as we know in Europe uh, interest rates now are really low so you can in Germany you can get a loan uh, for like less than one percent interest rate so if you compare that with the contracting model contracting model the cost of capital will be more expensive for you um, the other thing is that such model is for bigger projects so we say 500,000 um, euro or more, um, but despite of the high, higher financing costs, it is um, quite popular and um, is widely applied for street lighting projects. Um, now, uh, that was a contracting model. Now we move to energy performance contracting, which is basically um, 
linking you know your how much you pay for investment to the energy savings that you will achieve so it ver works very similar to the contracting model in the sense that you hire an ESCO who will do all of the street lighting upgrade for you or energy efficiency retrofits uh, for you um, and in the contract you explicitly um, provide what level of energy savings you would like achieve, to achieve and the energy cost savings that you achieve you use to pay off that contract and then you can have like different arrangements for energy performance contracts so you can like have a different arrangements on the level of energy savings that you uh, achieve and how you um, you know um, specify that and split that um, between you and ASCO you can also have a different arrangement in terms of um, how how you implement how immediately you implement the investment and energy efficiency measures and i will explain it um, in the next slide so the first one is um, the basic epc model with guaranteed savings which basically mean that um, if you look at the graph and you can see um, this uh, tall blue bar, which is your actual energy cost. This is before the investment happens. And then you sign an uh, energy performance contract with ESCO, where, where you say, for example, um, okay, we want to achieve 72% uh, um, energy savings. And uh, if you guys, or if ESCO doesn't achieve that, that of course they will have to to compensate that. So you sign this contract and in ha investment happens here. Investment happens, which, which means that uh, your energy efficiency improves and you receive um, energy savings and energy cost savings, which means that your energy bill goes down. And instead of having the tall blue bar, you get the, the, the low blue square. Um, and so you have some cost savings, which is this uh, red. Uh, red square um, and you use this cost savings to pay off the upgrade and so imagine you have a contract energy performance contract for 10 years like until yeah yeah year 10 so during 10 years you use your energy cost savings to pay off the investments and once you pay it off your energy bill remains low and then all the energy cost savings that you receive remain with you. So, um, yeah, so that's how it, um, how it works. Um, and uh, uh, the advantage for the municipality, again, that um, it doesn't have to bear the initial upfront investment costs. Somebody else does that for them. Um, they remain the owner of the, all of the upgraded equipment and they transfer, because they hire someone, they transfer all of the risks to the outsources, outsourced party. party. Um, but the, 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 the challenge is kind of that, um, you, as you can see, there is a di direct link between the contract provision and the energy cost savings. And when we talk about energy cost savings, we of course talk about energy price. So the challenge is that um, in countries where the energy price is not high enough, um, these contracts, uh, they take um, a long time, which means uh, way more than 10 years, uh, in some countries maybe 20 years uh, to, pay, to pay it off and that at some point it's not interesting for ASCO anymore because they have they have to wait too long to get their payment back. Um, so energy price is something that plays a, plays a role. Um, yeah, so uh, this example is another example of energy performance contract with shared uh, savings. I will not focus too much of it. So as I explained in the guaranteed savings um, energy performance contract, what you have is that in the contract you say, okay, um, this is the energy performance contract and we would like to receive 72, for example, um, um, energy energy savings, 72% energy savings. Um, and uh, the ASCO will probably do that because this is what um, the contract requires them to do, but they don't get any additional incentive to 
achieve more energy savings because even if they put an effort and do that, um, municipality benefits 100% from that and they don't benefit zero. So they don't benefit at all from, from this additional effort. So the shared savings APC, it, it tackles that barrier and it says, not the barrier, but kind of uh, gap and a shared savings means that uh, the contract says that, okay, um, the ASCO guarantees to achieve this and this many energy savings, but if they achieve more then the cost savings coming from those additional, uh, you know, uh, achievements by the ASCO, they, they are split between the city and the private partner, let's say 50-50. Yeah, so that creates an incentive for ASCO to go beyond the guaranteed level of energy savings and put an extra effort because then they get a, um, a financial benefit from it. Um, so that was discussion like, okay, how do we arrange, the, you know, the energy savings provisions with ASCO? The other dimension is um, how do you uh, distribute investment or actual upgrade throughout the contract time? And you can do it either um, immediately, right? So the contract starts today and in year one, you upgrade all of the public assets that are included in that contract. Um, or you can do um, the other way. You can say like, okay, our EPC or energy performance contract is for the next um, 15 years. So let's see, um, let's, uh, let's upgrade the oldest um, street lighting or the oldest um, public buildings in the first five years. And then in the next five years, we upgrade the next bunch and, and so on and so on. So you kind of uh, distribute equally throughout the contract term, uh, which, uh, which assets have to be un upgraded and when. And both approaches have uh, their advantages and disadvantages. So the main advantage of the approach when you say like, okay, we want to upgrade all of the, you know, all of the street lighting or all of the, you know, buildings included in the EPC, we want to upgrade them immediately. The benefit is that um, you, you know, you upgrade everything fast in the first years and you maximize your energy savings, right? So that's the obvious benefit. Um, the disadvantage is that it's it's um, it's a lot of construction uh, uh, work uh, 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 at the same time, um, and also it's kind of um, if you upgrade everything in the first year and then you pay off this contract in the next 15 years, once your contract is over at the end of this 15 years, you end up again with an outdated infrastructure. And so you do not include all of the technology developments and kind of the, you know, different age of your infrastructure in this type of approach. And that is a, uh, yeah, that is something that is tackled by, by, you know, the staggered savings EPC, which basically means um, um, you you look at your public infrastructure and you say, okay, this is the oldest and the least uh, efficient um, share of assets. We do them in the first five years, and then we take the next um, um, a part of the infrastructure, which, which is old but not as bad, can wait another five years, and so on and so on. And actually, um, this approach is um, something that is used more um, then, you know, uh, the immediate savings approach. Uh, one example would be for the uh, city of Hilden, where they um, they had to modernize um, uh, almost all of their street lighting. And um, uh, the street lighting, even though it's quite a, a homogeneous uh, technology, um, you still have um, most of the municipalities, they have, uh, you know, some streets with really old, um, luminaries and 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 some streets which were updated some years ago and so on and so on. So they are all of different technology and age, and so the solution was that um, every five years they they upgrade a part of the street lighting infrastructure. The oldest go first, and then it goes on until the whole street lighting is is upgraded to a you know to a needed level. 
Um, and uh, one example I wanted to show you is an example from Spain. Um, it was about um, energy performance contracting, but also um, an example of project bundling, something that Xenia was mentioning that many of energy efficiency projects, they are, um, especially if we talk about municipalities, European municipalities, most of, the, of them are small. And, and what they face um, as a challenge is that they are too small and not interesting enough for ASCOs. And uh, project bundling is something that can tackle this challenge because then you um, kind of um, create a scale which is interesting for private sector. Um, and this is what something this is something that was done in Spain. It was the the, the province of uh, Huelva. Um, they did that in 2015 where they had. Um, they had a, a, a quite a long consultation process, um, which is uh, something that has to be mentioned about project bundling because um, you do pay a transaction cost uh, to come up with a, a bankable bundle of projects where everyone agrees on its part. And for, for, for this municipality, it took them, I think, at least two or three years to agree on the final package. But anyway, they had nine municipalities and they did a, a kind of a, a joint procurement uh, process for street lighting upgrades in each of these municipalities. And um, that was, uh, yeah, that was something which uh, included energy performance contracting, but also um, energy service contract. A very similar approach was um, uh, done in Croatia, where they also had several uh, smaller municipalities, um, and they um, kind of uh, also uh, created um, a bundled, uh, bundled project approach and um, um, selected different, actually different models for different municipalities in terms of uh, financial arrangements. Um, now I'm moving. I, I think, yeah, I'm I so sorry. I, yeah. You said yeah. I should interrupt you. I think it's time <laughs> that I have yeah, to do yeah, that no because unfortunately yeah, yeah. we're, we're okay. running um, over time. Um, would you like to have one minute for wrap up? Um, because I don't think we have more time than that. Yeah. Yeah, I will do that. Um, I'm sorry for stretching over my allowed time. I will just uh, say uh, like a last minute is that um, there is finance available and there are multiple sources and models and financial instruments which can be employed for energy efficiency. And this slide provides again an overview. It's, it's really a variety, diversity of models and um, uh, from the municipality perspective, you can say that there is like kind of a one size fit, fits all because uh, when we talk about energy efficiency, it's a very heterogeneous um, technology. So um, uh, you really have to look at the various factors and based on that, select the, the financing instrument that works. Some of the key consideration would be to look at, first of all, uh, availability of public policies and fundings that like step number one, if you are municipalities, look what kind of funding sources there are. Uh, second, second one is project size and bank bankability. Something really obvious, the bigger the project, the, the more you need private sector engagement. And if you need private sector engagement, you, you have to look at what kind of um, risk return, what kind of internal rate of uh, internal rate of return you can offer to the private sector so that it's, it, that it's interesting for them. Um, which brings me to ESCO market, which basically means the more advanced and mature ESCO market is, the more they can offer at the competitive uh, rates. Um, and then also municipalities have to look at their own um, borrowing capacity and ability to raise capital, um, be it bonds, um, be it um, uh, other um, debt instruments from the capital markets. So this is something that um, kind of summarizes the discussion. Yeah, thank you so much. And sorry again for stress, for taking too, too, too much time. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you, Katarina, very much. And um, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a huge topic and uh, a lot of information uh, is there on potential financial models. So uh, no 
Uh, no surprise that uh, you went over time, but I think it's very useful information for both our listeners and uh, potential municipalities who want to work in this um, in this topic. And uh, I I know that you have much more information available in your presentation, and we will definitely make it available uh, in in its full size uh, when we uh, upload recordings to knowledge management system but i also think that uh, ikim has a, a full report about financial models maybe you should mention where people can find it if they want to get more information about that exactly so the, uh, there are the, all the reports are published at the dynamic light website which has its separate website and the last the my last slide um, of the presentation it also includes the the link to all of the presentations uh, i'm sorry to all of the reports where where you can look at the you know different elements including the financing models and sources and and we also had a survey on the barriers so all of the information is um open source online that sounds great um we will make sure that um our listeners will get that link to as part of your presentation but i would like to um thank both of our speakers both oleg and uh, katerina for very interesting and uh, quite different from the approach and angle presentations but still dealing with this very important topic to um, invest into energy efficiency oleg gave us a review of, of the barriers from the study which uh, he was leading and uh, uh, emphasized the importance of policy framework and um, a regulatory framework to support and to create an enabling environment for investments. And Katerina uh, guided us through potential models for actual financing of energy efficiency projects, looking at different uh, pros and cons and different success factors and prerequis prerequisites for uh, different financial models. And thank you very much for uh, specific examples from different cities and countries that I found myself very useful and hope so did our listeners. And uh, now we're moving, we still have uh, some minutes for a couple of questions and if we don't uh, address the questions now here online. Um, I will send those questions to, to our speakers and hopefully you can communicate um, via email. But let's uh, um, look at some questions which we received from the audience. And uh, the first question will be to Oleg. And that's a bit long one, um, but I will try to summarize it a bit. So Oleg, um, this is for you. Besides energy efficiency not being a core business, neither for public nor industrial sector, investors expect not only return on investment, but also return off investment. Even though there are uh, lots of energy efficiency projects, the credit risk normally doesn't justify an investment by institutional investors, also since investors are not remunerated risk-adjusted returns. Since all energy efficiency investments to be done um, can neither be subsidized by governments nor financed by low interest rate loans um, via banks, did you analyze the market to see if potential clients that could do energy efficiency projects are willing to pay higher rates to institutional investors? Oleg, um, would you like to answer this uh, quite complex question? But I think yeah. very valid one about institutional investors, which is a, which is a, a, a topic in itself. But uh, if you could spend a couple of minutes. Thank uh, you. Xie. It is that. a long and complicated and complex question. I fully mm -hmm. agree. Uh, the fact that the investors do want not only sufficiently high return on investment, but actually that the the invest the invested money they get them back and plus interest that that makes sense uh, i believe what we are talking about that we are not yet at the stage probably anywhere uh, maybe in western countries more in others less uh, but still not anywhere close to investments in energy efficiency as business and uh, business as usual and that is a problem uh, the uh, i think the the way to go about it is 
to think less of subsidies uh, and think more of creating what we call a conducive environment for energy efficiency investments. It does take time. It is not easy, but it is possible. And we have seen the examples. Also, what uh, Katarina uh, has provided, Katarina has provided in her presentation, I think that gives a very good and interesting overview of what can be achieved in municipalities in this case. Uh, same goes for, uh, for industrial companies. Uh, so I think um, it, it is solvable. It is not that easy to solve. Uh, the issue that uh, you, Xenia, touched upon uh, in, in your presentation, the issue of bundling relatively small um, investment projects into one, into a bigger one, is also one of the possible solutions. I would also like to use um, a phrase from uh, uh, one of the uh, members of the Bureau of the Group of Experts on Energy Efficiency in, um, uh, in UNEC, and that is that uh, industrial energy efficiency is not difficult, it's just complicated. So I think the idea is to make it less complicated so investors can uh, look at it as an interesting and viable business proposition. Thank you, Oleg, very much for your for your answer. I couldn't uh, agree more. Um, but let's uh, move on to the next question to Katerina. Um, this is a question about ESCOs, and uh, this is always um, an interesting discussion, especially for those countries where ESCO market is not um, that developed. So the question is, for those financing schemes, where does an ESCO get the money from? Most ESCOs, since they are mostly SMEs, do not have sufficient funds to finance the project up front. Katerina? Okay. So <clears throat> uh, the first question was where the ESCO gets money from, uh, as I understood. Um, and, this, and the second question, what SMEs can do because they don't have sufficient resources? Well, right? I think that, yeah, I think they're quite linked. So the main question is if ESCOs, which are usually small and medium enterprises, they usually have limited um, funds to invest into projects, how mm -hmm. they actually start financing energy efficiency projects if, if, if they, we're not talking about very small ones. Uh, I mean, as an energy service company, um, when you when you have a contract with a municipality, which would be a usual suspect when we talk about uh, working with ASCO, then you um, you basically um, your profit is the margin that you get on the top of the investment cost that you um, do on the behalf of the municipality, and that's the the source of your uh, profit, uh, so to say, and that brings uh, me again to this point about the energy price. So uh, the example, uh, we have mature ASCO markets where we have sufficient, sufficiently high energy price because that what kind of stimulates, um, you know, uh, provides uh, sufficient financial incentive for ASCOs to work. And for the upfront investment as an ASCO, of course you can, uh, and I think that's what most ASCOs do, they work with the banks. Um, and they have a, um, they they borrow. Uh, they have a, maybe a, some preferential interest rates or uh, below the market rate um, interest rates uh, for the upfront investment cost. And then, of course, the cost of capital that they uh, pay for you know to raise initial investment for the inv to you know to put put up this initial investment cost. They will inc include it in the margin that is going to be charged. Um, you know, uh, to the municipality or to whoever the client is. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to maybe use my uh, position as a moderator and just interrogate Katerina a little bit yeah, more yeah. on what you just say. Um, yes, exactly. It's uh, quite clear how ESCOs work in, in, in when the market is mature. Um, but what we saw from my presentation, also from Oleg's presentations, many countries which we are working with, 
uh, actually don't have the, the mature ESCO market and mm. still in many countries in the world the uh, energy prices are quite low and subsidized and of course this has to be solved but it obviously we know it will take time to to make it to the market level so my question would be uh, in these circumstances when we have undeveloped ESCO market and probably uh, local banks are not that um ready to finance energy efficiency projects and they maybe they don't have the understanding what it is what uh what would you be what would be your recommendation for municipalities uh in terms of um choosing financing model for their energy efficiency projects already now or what are the actions which they would need to take to at least start solving this problem um i mean I, I am not a uh, ESCO expert. <laughs> I am very humble on that. But uh, what we, we could see from the examples that we um, came up across uh, throughout the project. So one element is that uh, when you don't have a develop, uh, developed mature ESCO market, um, one of the purposes of energy efficiency directive was actually to um, facilitate the development of, uh, of ESCO market. And uh, one of the recommended instruments was uh, white certificates or energy efficiency obligation schemes. And um, one example where this scheme uh, worked quite well in promoting ESCO market was Italy, because um, there, even though the you know, the obliged party to the white certificate scheme was, um, um, I think it was gas gas and energy distributors with customers of over 50,000 uh, 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 customers over 50,000. But um, the main uh, generators of energy efficiency savings and white certificates were ASCOs. And that's something that really shows an example that um, a good, uh, well-designed policy incentive can can stimulate development of of ESCO market from 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 the perspective of municipality. Of course, um, if you are a municipality, you cannot drive a national change in terms of you know facilitation of ESCO market. You can you can not you can you have to choose from the instruments that you have available. And then we go back to you know uh, promotional programs of multilateral development banks of public development banks. So low interest rate loans or um, concessional loans or maybe option of uh, bonds if you if you um, you know have a technical support um, on that um and so on so you you basically as a municipality you cannot uh uh you don't have the the capacity and you are not in the position uh i think to to you know to drive the development of esco market thank you thank you katarina for um such elaborated um answer we are officially running out of time but um i probably will ask one more question uh to oleg and we do have actually quite a few questions remaining um but i hope our speakers will be kind enough to have a look at them uh via email um and we apologize for not taking your questions online today but the last question and the um, Colleague, if you, Oleg, if you can answer that briefly. Um, you mentioned several times the importance of enabling uh, investment environment and how policies and regulatory frameworks can facilitate um, that and create the far, far, favorable conditions for investments. Uh, could you summarize what the key components are or requirements are to create this enabling environment? Uh, thank you, Ksenia. Uh, I think it, uh, when I said at the very beginning of my uh, presentation that we looked at the, uh, what, what essentially uh, constituted the main um, ways on what the ways could be recommended to increase the financial flows, that was uh, in big, quite, quite significantly looking at the political regulatory uh, environment that countries that the governments create in their uh, countries and i believe that what we see from the examples from the countries or other from responses that we received from the survey is then is that when the uh, legislative framework and all components of it where the policies are in place where the uh, norms and standards are in place, where the institutions work and support 
uh, the energy efficiency measures, projects and investments, the situation is significantly better than where some of this or most of this does not exist. So I would say it, it has to do with the diligent work by the governments to work on this. And in addition, I would like to emphasize what was mentioned in my presentation is the issue of the multiple benefits is important. And that is also for the, um, uh, for the governments to consider what constitutes, uh, and we believe that energy efficiency is one of the cases, what constitutes public good. So if you see energy efficiency as public good, then making additional uh, public uh, investments in it or creating the opportunities to leverage public investments with private money is very important. Uh, so I would like to stop there, but that's that's what I think on the question that you asked. Thank you, Oleg, Thank you. very much. And I think that's uh, also quite a nice summary of, uh, of uh, a number of issues which we touched upon today. Again, it's a huge topic and um, I think we just kind of scratched the surface, but um, there is a lot of materials available from all our organizations on this topic and other topics on energy efficiency. So um, feel free to come back to our websites and uh, you will also receive the notification when we'll have all materials um, available online on our knowledge management system. Just to mention again that our knowledge management system also consolidates a number of resources, uh, publications, tools, uh, webinar recordings on energy efficiency. Uh, and you can uh, access it by following the link which, which you have uh, on your screens right now. And I also would like to thank uh, all the participants who uh, were listening and stayed up until the end. We still have a number of people online. Thank you very much uh, for listening and very active participation with all your questions. Again, we will try to uh, answer them offline. Um, I wish you all great um, remaining uh, of, of your day wherever you are and uh, please stay tuned because we have new um, uh, upcoming webinars we are conducting webinars regularly so if you want to receive the information make sure that you are subscribed to our mailing list so thank you very much to both participants and our speakers and now i'm closing this webinar thank you